Cover Her Face by P.D. James, dramatized by Neville Teller, with Sean Phillips, Hugh Grant, and Beatty Adney. Exactly when and where did the killing begin? Oh, about the events themselves, there was no mystery. It all came out in the trial of the newspapers. But at what moment did the actual murder start to happen? That was what bothered me for such a long time. I needed to work it out. So over and over again, I traced back the events that led to the tragedy. And you know... At last, I think I really did fix on the starting point. Thank you, Sally. We'll ring for you to clear. Yes, madam. So, that's Sally Jupp. Mm -hmm. Pretty young thing, isn't she? All that golden hair. Mm, a little too pretty for her own good, Doctor. Evidently. Now, do you like having a baby around the house again, Eleanor? The dinner party I threw at Martingale. That was the opening scene of tragedy. Martingale. Even in the 50s, it was an anachronism for ordinary middle-class people to be living in an Elizabethan manor house handed down through the generations. Sally's baby doesn't bother you, does it, Mother? Not at all. It's Martha I'm worried about. She needs the help, of course, but she's very conservative. I don't really know what she thinks of having an unmarried mother around her kitchen. I suppose we Maxies were an anachronism. Leftovers from the interwar years. <laughs> How on earth did we survive unscathed into the 1950s? Not that financial problems weren't looming even then. Mother and daughter don't see eye to eye on everything, but once Deborah had come back home after her husband's death, we were as one in scheming and planning. Cutting back here, economising there, employing untrained girls like Sally Jupp to help Martha. Our one aim was to see Stephen through his medical training and preserve his inheritance. We were determined that when Simon, bedridden and nearly helpless in an upstairs bedroom, finally slipped away, Stephen would succeed his father to the house and grounds, just as Simon himself had inherited them from his father. Oh, I shouldn't worry about Martha too much. An extra pair of hands about the place will soon overcome any moral scruples on her part. <laughs> I'm not at all sure that moral scruples ought to be so easily cast aside, Doctor. Ah, but can you afford to take too moral a position, Miss Liddell? After all, as head of St Mary's Refuge, unmarried mothers are your bread and butter. <clears throat> Take Sally Jarp. Oh, a case in point, Dr. Maxey. A baby and no father to fix an affiliation order on. At least the girl refuses to name him. Oh, yes, it's on practical experience that I base my views. And they are? In a word, I see no reason why a girl who's simply gone after a good time, quite regardless should receive more consideration from society than a young married mother struggling to bring up a family decently and respectably. Oh, uh, a few shillings from society don't go very far these days. This is a Christian country, my dear brother. The wages of sin are supposed to be death, not eight bob of the taxpayer's money. Yet, Mrs Riscoe, that's the position we've reached in this country. And if those seem like revolutionary ideas, then that's even further proof of the decline in our moral standards. <laughs> An ordinary dinner party. Rather dull, really. Yet memory, selective and perverse, now invests it with an aura of foreboding and unease. In retrospect, it's become a ritual gathering of victim and suspects. Not all the suspects, of course. Felix Hearn, for one, wasn't at Martingale that weekend. Make the most of me, Felix, while you can. I can't really see my freedom lasting. Martha will certainly have her out in time, and I don't really blame her. She doesn't like Sally Jupp, and neither do I. Now, I wonder why that is, Deborah, my love. Is the girl perhaps chasing after your precious brother? Don't be vulgar, Felix. <laughs> but to be honest, Stephen does seem rather impressed. 
I think it's because she asks his advice about the baby whenever he's at home. I've tried to point out that he's supposed to be a surgeon, not a paediatrician, but it doesn't <laughs> stop her. You'll see for yourself on Saturday. And who else will be there, apart from the intriguing Sally Jarvis? Stephen, of course. And Catherine Bowers. You met her the last time you were at Martingale. So I did. Rather poached egg eyes, but an agreeable figure. And more intelligence than you or Stephen were willing to allow her. If she impressed you so much, then our annual fate is a golden opportunity to give Stephen a break. He was rather taken with her once, and now she sticks to him like a limpet. It bores him horribly. By rather taken, I suppose you mean that Stephen seduced her. Well, he must find his own way out of that. I certainly shan't intervene. But I won't miss your fate. I have a feeling the weekend will be rather interesting. A house full of people all disliking each other is bound to be explosive. Oh, it isn't as bad as that. Very nearly. To start off with, Stephen doesn't like me. He's never bothered to hide it. I think he thinks we're having an affair. I sometimes wonder why we aren't. Well, one good reason is you don't really want to. I certainly don't want to fall in love again. You're right about that. Edward's death. I never want to go through all that again. But an affair, Felix. Darling Deborah, uh, let me explain. Interrogation at the hands of the Gestapo affected people in different ways. Those that survived, of course. Some emerged determined to devote the rest of their lives to humanity... Others were convinced that life owed them some sort of recompense and they've spent the last ten years grabbing at any pleasure that comes their way. With me it's different. I'm afraid I've become rather suspicious of life. It takes me longer and longer these days to commit myself to anything. I understand, Felix. No, honestly, I do. And by the way, I don't think Stephen does dislike you. Oh, yes, he does. And you don't like Catherine Bowers, which means she dislikes you and will probably extend her feelings to me. Martha and you dislike Sally Jarp, and she, poor girl, probably loathes you all. I suppose that pathetic creature Miss Liddell will be there, a more unsuitable person to run a home for unmarried mothers it would be difficult to imagine. Your mother doesn't like her, that I do know, so all in all, this weekend is going to be a perfect orgy of suppressed emotion. Deborah! Collie said you were up here. Sorry I was out. Have you been waiting long? About a quarter of an hour. But I only came here on the off chance. I was having lunch with Felix. I suddenly thought I'd call in at the hospital before starting home. Lovely to see you, big sister. I've spent most of the time looking out of the window. Then you saw her? Yes, Stephen. I did see you and Sally Jupp. You could hardly miss all that golden hair, even from the fourth floor. Deb, I want you to look at something. Here, these tablets. Have you seen them before? Aren't they some of father's? Where did you get them? Sally found them and brought them up to me. She phoned from Liverpool Street to ask me to meet her. She found them in father's bed. How do you mean? I don't understand. She found them between the mattress cover and the mattress, down the side. His drawer sheet was rucked and she was smoothing it when she noticed a little bulge in the corner of the mattress underneath the fitted cover. This is what she found. Ten of them, tied up in a handkerchief. Father must have been saving them for weeks, perhaps months. I can guess why. Does he know she found them? She doesn't think so. Of course, we don't really know if he's still capable of acting independently at all. They may have been there for some time and he may have lost the power to get at them and use them. We can't tell what goes on in his mind. Trouble is, none of us has bothered to try. Except Sally. But, Stephen, that isn't true. We sit with him, we nurse him, but he just lies there... He doesn't seem to notice people any more. He isn't really father. There's no contact between us. I have tried. I swear I have. But to deceive us all systematically and hide away ten tablets one by one, it must have happened months ago. I can't believe he could manage it now, not without Martha knowing. She does most of the heavier nursing after all. Well, he obviously managed to deceive Martha. But I blame myself... I'm supposed to be a doctor. I ought to have thought. At least Sally treated him like a human being. She's very devoted to Father. She seems to be extending her devotion to you. What on earth do you mean? Why come all the way to London? Why not tell Mother about the tablets? Or me? Be honest now, Deb. You haven't done much to encourage her to confide in you, have you? What do you want me to do? Hold her hand? I don't like her and I don't expect her to like me. It's not true that you don't like her. You hate her. Well, at least she has a very vigorous champion in you. A pity you'll be safely here at the hospital when the trouble starts. What trouble? Why on earth assume Sally's going to make trouble? Because she's making trouble already, isn't she? 
but I suppose you find her less dreary than Catherine. Isn't it time you ended that affair gracefully? How? I'm a coward about these things. I've never found it particularly difficult. The art lies in making the other person believe they've done it. And if they won't cooperate? Men have died and worms have eaten them, but not for love. Look, you'd better take these tablets home. I'll put them in a bottle. Put this in the medicine cupboard in Father's room. And I think it would be wiser if we took Father off the tablets altogether. I'll get a prescription made up in the dispensary. The same kind of drug, only in solution. Give him a tablespoonful at night in water and do it yourself. Just tell Martha I've stopped the tablets. I'll explain it all to Dr Epps when I see him on Saturday. Well, close the door behind you. Oh, you're late. I think that child is starving, poor mate. Where have you been? Well, you won't have to wait much longer, will you, my pet? Oh, Martha, isn't there any milk boys? There is not. I'm not here to wait on you, Sally Jupp. Please remember that. If you want milk, you must boil it yourself. You know well enough what time that child ought to be fed. It doesn't matter. It won't take long. Sally, there's, uh, there's something I want to ask you. Oh, yes. I'll ask away. Did you take anything from the master's bed when you made it this morning? Anything belonging to him? I want the truth now. Well, it's quite obvious you know I did. Do you mean to tell me you knew he had those tablets hidden away and you said nothing? Of course I knew. I've nursed him for five solid years. Who'd know what he does and what he thinks of if not me? Oh, I suppose you thought he'd take them. Of course he wouldn't have taken them. But if you had to lie there year after year, perhaps you'd like to know that you had something that could end all that pain. Something that nobody else knew about. Until his silly little bitch no better than she should be come ferreting them out. Oh, very clever, weren't you? But you can give them back to me. And if you mention a word of this to anyone, I'll have you out, you and that brat. I'll find a way, never fear. Oh, I'm afraid you're unlucky. I haven't got the tablets. I took them to Stephen this afternoon. You what? Yes, Stephen. And now I've heard all that silly twaddle, I'm glad I did. Just imagine Stephen's face if I were to tell him that you knew all along. You wouldn't. And why not? Dear, faithful old Martha... So devoted to the family. You don't care a damn for any of them, you old hypocrite, except for your precious master. What? Pet, you can't see yourself. Washing him, stroking his face, cooing to him as if he were a baby. It's indecent. Lucky for him, he's half gaga. Being mauled about by you'd make any normal man sick. All right, my pet. Who's ready for a supper? You're a wicked, evil girl. And you deserve to be dead. The children's three-legged race will start in the paddock in five minutes. All those competing through the paddock, please. Not an easy choice, Mrs Webster. And both prints are the same price. Five shillings each. Why not take them both, Mrs Webster? They make a good pair. The first quarrel and reconciliation. By the same artist, too. Ten shillings, I don't know. Catherine's quite right, you know. They are made to hang side by side. I tell you what. I'll let you have them for seven and six the pair. How about that? Oh. I'd take it if I were you, Mrs Webster. That's a real bargain. You've talked me into it, Miss Buzz. <laughs> well done, Catherine. I'll just wrap them up for you. Deborah, you don't happen to know who donated them to your white elephant stall, do you? I do, but I shouldn't really say. Not ethical. Oh, go on. Do tell. Well, they were sent in by old Mr Mortimer. I think they hung in his bedroom, but now he's on his own. He's shut up the first floor altogether. The house is too much for him. Poor man. Here you are, Mrs Webster. Thank you very much. I'll just take these to the car. Good luck with the stall. This is quite fun, Deborah. I didn't think it would be. Amazing what people want to get rid of. It's even more astonishing what people would buy. Do you think Stephen will be coming by? Shouldn't think so. He's too busy with the horses. I say, Dr Epps, uh, I've got just the thing for you. Good afternoon, ladies. Are you about to make me an offer I can't refuse? Precisely, <laughs> Doctor. Now, what do you say about this? Isn't this the most practicable winter top coat you've ever seen? Oh. And look, a detachable waterproof lining, oh, ideal yes. for visiting the sick in winter. What a saleswoman. Yes, I must admit it. it, it. Hold on, now. This garment rings a bell. 
Haven't I seen it? I know. Sir Reynold Price. He's seen through your guilty secret, Deborah. All right, I own up. It is Sir Reynolds' contribution. Are you too proud to wear it? Oh, nothing of the sort. Here, let me try it on. Now, what do you think? Perfect. <laughs> you look splendid, Dr. Epps. Well, I'll take it. Oh, how much? One pound. And cheap at the price. Done. Now, I think I'll escape you two sirens before I get even more entrapped in your clutches. What a pair! <laughs> Debra, why don't we go and grab some tea? The tent seems to be filling up rather rapidly. Good idea. I'm dying for a cup. I think I'll go through the house and get a wash. My hands are filthy. Hey, you! What are you doing in here? Uh, me? Uh, do you mean me? Yes. This is a private house. Sorry, I was looking for the toilet. The lavatory's in the garden. It's very well signposted. Oh, yes, of course. I'm sorry. <laughs> the tea tent was crowded and the noise deafening. A confused clatter of crockery, the babble of voices, and behind it all, the music from the loudspeakers. The concentration of noise was so great that when a dozen conversations faltered and died, it seemed to me as if total silence had fallen. I looked up to see what had happened. Sally Jupp had come into the tent. Sally in a white dress with a low boat-shaped neckline and a skirt of swirling pleats, a dress identical with the one Deborah was wearing. Sally, with a green cummerbund which was a replica of the one round Deborah's waist. The silence seemed profound. Then from the far end of the tent where some of Miss Liddell's girls had formed a small group, there was a quickly suppressed giggling. Only Deborah seemed unconcerned. Without a second glance at Sally, she collected some tea and joined Catherine at a table. How dare she? It's a deliberate insult. Where did she get the dress from? The same place I did. Anyone could buy it who took the trouble to find it. Sally must have thought it worth the trouble. You're taking it very calmly. What would you like me to do? Tear it off her back? There's a limit to the free entertainment the village can expect. Despite this incident, the day was being judged a great success as we gathered in the dining room that evening. French windows opened wide to the ravaged lawn. Uh, these glasses, Mrs. Maxey? That's right, Felix. I'm afraid it's only cider tonight. Very superior brand, though. Not far short of Devonshire Scrumpy. Have you ever tried it, Mr. Hearn? It's quite potent. I haven't, Doctor, but I will. Thank you. Anybody else? Eleanor? Thank you. I'll wait till we sit down. Miss Liddell? Not if it's alcoholic, Dr Epps. Well, I'm afraid it is. Then I shall stick with fruit juice. Uh, where do you want the spoons, Mrs Risco? Oh, um, leave them on the sideboard. We'll circulate them with the pudding. I'll have a small sherry, Felix, if you can find it. Of oh, course. Oh, dear, these table napkins. Why can I never get them to stand up straight? Good evening, everybody. Oh, oh. Catherine. Hello, Mrs Maxey. <laughs> Hello, Catherine. Isn't Stephen with you? no. No, he's not. I haven't seen him since he was with the horses. I've been in my room. Oh, he probably walked home with Bocock to help with the stabling. Or perhaps he's changing. I don't think we'll wait. Shall we sit down? Who's waiting at table? Where's Sally? Not in, apparently. Martha tells me that Jimmy's in his cot, so she must have come in and gone out again. But, Mrs Magsy, there she is, coming across the lawn. And Stephen's with her. Hello, Dr Maxey. We were wondering where you were. Good evening, Miss Liddell. Come inside, Stephen. I'm glad you're back. Sally, you'd better change into your uniform and help Martha. Do you really think so, madam? Sally! What do you mean? Well, madam, I wonder if a maid's uniform would be entirely appropriate for the girl your son has just asked to marry him. Simon was no better and no worse that night. Yet I stayed on the daybed in his dressing room as if there were a crisis and heard the hours strike one by one through the long vigil of the night. Sleep was impossible as I lived through the scene in the drawing-room again and again, so many times that there seemed no second of it I couldn't recall with vivid clarity. Sally Jupp, remember your place. To marry him? Is this true, Stephen? Of course. Stephen? My place? Perhaps you can tell me just what my place is now. It's your place to be polite and grateful, my girl. 
You've just been intolerably rude to Mrs. Maxey. Have you forgotten that she took you in, you and your baby? She's given you a home and your keep. Is this how you repay her? Miss Liddell, No, Mrs. Please. Maxey, this needs saying. Just look at you in that dress. You deliberately chose to embarrass Mrs. Risco this afternoon. Please, Miss Liddell, let it pass. No, why should I? Why should any of us? That's the trouble with all of us these days. We turn a blind eye to things most of us find intolerable, if truth were told. And look at the result. A generation without morals, without standards, without gratitude. Gratitude? You think I ought to be grateful to you? You certainly should. St Mary's Refuge looked after you when you had nowhere else to turn. But just think what I've done for you. I saw you through your pregnancy. I trusted you. I taught you how to live among decent people. And then I found you the best job any girl in your position could hope for. You sex-starved old hypocrite. Don't you talk about what you've done for me. You're not doing it for me or any of us. You're doing it for yourself. You get some sort of perverted pleasure in queening it over us all. Don't think I don't know. And that's not all. There's much more I could tell the village about you if I wanted to. You be thankful I know how to keep my mouth shut. Lying in Simon's dressing room during the long watches of the night, I found myself remembering with uncomfortable vividness Catherine Bower's face, flushed with grief or resentment. Felix Hearn was the only member of the party who seemed to enjoy his dinner. I wasn't sure that the preliminaries hadn't actually sharpened his appetite. He certainly put himself out to ease Catherine's embarrassment. Felix was very amusing when he cared to exert himself, and that night he had, surprisingly, succeeded in producing laughter by the end of the meal. At some point during the night, it rained heavily. At five o'clock, I thought I heard Simon stirring, and I went to him, but he still lay in the rigid stupor produced by the medicine which Stephen had prescribed. At six o'clock... I got up, put on my dressing gown, and made some tea. Yes? Who is it? It's me, Mrs. Maxey. Catherine, can I come in? Of course. What is it, my dear? I couldn't sleep any more. I hope you don't mind. (sighs) Of course not. Come in. I'm just having a cup of tea. Would you like one? Yes, please. To be honest, I haven't slept much all night. The rain kept me awake for a long time, and then I woke very early with a headache. Oh, I'm sorry. Have you still got it? I'm afraid so. I don't get them very often now, but when I do, they're agonising. You don't happen to have any aspirin, do you? I'm sure we have some in the medicine cupboard. You're the nurse. Why don't you help yourself while I pour the tea? Thank you very much. Do you take sugar? Just one, please. There you are. Thank you. You know, Sally's announcement came as a great shock to me, Mrs. Maxey. It was a great surprise to us all. But I had hoped. I know you and Stephen were quite close at one time, Catherine, but I thought it was all over between you long ago. Well, clearly Stephen thought so too. But you... I still love him. I think I always will. I don't think you will, you know. It may sound a bit unfeeling, but by and large, people get over unrequited love. Yes, but is it really unrequited? That's my difficulty. When we were in love, it seemed so permanent. I can't believe that all we meant to each other has simply vanished into thin air. Perhaps what's happened to Stephen is a temporary infatuation. That's not unknown, is it, Mrs Maxey? I have to find out. Do you see that painting up there? The nude? I was wondering. It seems somehow inappropriate. Do you like it? Well, yes. Yes, I do. You don't know who painted it? No. You don't mean my father? (laughs) Yes, it's a Bowers. That means something these days, though not when I bought it. I never liked your father, you know, but I did think he was an artist. I don't believe your mother thought so. Oh, poor Katie, one day he simply packed up and left you both. Yes. Katie and I had been very close. When she fell madly in love with Christian Bowers, nothing could persuade her that he wasn't in love with her. Nothing. Her friends could see it. I could. I tried, but she talked him into marrying her. You know the result. I suppose so. 
Ask your mother about unrequited love. See what she tells you. I will. One other thing, Catherine. You may find this strange, but one of the reasons I love having you as a guest here at Martingale is simply because of the pleasure that painting has given me over the years. Can you believe that? Come in. Good morning, madam. Yes, Martha, what is it? It's Sally, madam. She's overslept again. Oh, she's quite impossible. She's almost never down on time these mornings. Well, wake her up. But I called her and she didn't answer. And when I tried the door, I found she's bolted in. Bolted in? Well, I can't get in, madam. I'm sure I don't know what she's playing at. Have you knocked really hard? Well, hard enough to wake her. Well, you'd better try again. Sally had a busy day yesterday. We all did. People don't oversleep without reason. As Catherine and I sat there finishing our tea, a curious feeling, the imminence of evil, took hold of me. When I replaced my cup in the saucer, it was with a clinical detachment and a kind of wonder that I saw my hand wasn't shaking. It's no good, madam. I can't make her hear me. Well, the baby's awake. He's whimpering in there, but I can't make Sally hear. Sally! Sally! Are you there? Oh, why is the door locked? Sally! Wake up! Oh, my God, madam, something's wrong, something's happened. Oh, you may be right. What shall I do? What shall we do? Stay here, Mrs Maxey, don't worry. I'll fetch your son. I won't be a minute. Keep calm. Oh, the door's too solid. I'll never break it down. We'll have to get through the window. The ladder in the outhouse will do. I'll get Felix Hearn to help. You'll wait here. We'll be as quick as we can. Oh, madam, something terrible's happened, I'm sure of it. Who locked the door? It's locked on the inside. Didn't she usually lock her door? Of course not. Who ever heard of a maid locking herself in? I could always get in to shake her away. Hello, Mother. Stephen told me what's up. He and Felix are getting the ladder. Oh, where on earth have they got to? It's bound to take a little time, but they won't be long. I'm sure she's all right. She's probably still asleep. Well, she can't have slept through all this. We've made enough noise to wake the dead. To say nothing of little Jimmy in there. I wonder if she's inside the room at all. What do you mean? I expect she won't be there. She's gone. And what about the locked door? Knowing Sally, my guess is that she wanted to do it the spectacular way and got out through the window. She seems to have a penchant for making scenes, even when she can't be present to enjoy them. Oh, Deborah! No, really! Here we are, shivering with apprehension, while Stephen and Felix lug ladders about, and the whole of the household is totally disorganised. I can see her planning the whole thing, just as she planned that spectacular entrance to the tea tent yesterday. To say nothing of her outburst last night... She's compulsively theatrical and thoroughly disruptive. She wouldn't leave her baby. No mother would. This one apparently has. <coughs> Felix? What's happened? Let me in. <coughs> Dear heaven, it can't be. She's dead. <gasps> Oh, my God! Oh, 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 my God! Oh, oh, oh. I felt, rather than heard, the thud of Martha's retreating footsteps. No one followed her. Deborah and I pushed past Felix's restraining arm and moved silently as if under some united compulsion to where Sally lay. The window was open, and the pillow on the bed was blodged with rain. Over the pillow, Sally's hair was spread like a web of gold. Her eyes were closed, but she wasn't asleep. From the clenched corner of her mouth, a thin trickle of blood had dried like a black slash. On each side of her neck was a bruise, an indelible sign of where the life had been choked out of her. In episode one of Cover Her Face by P.D. James, dramatised by Neville Teller, Sean Phillips played Mrs. Maxey, Hugh Grant, Felix, Beatty Adney, Deborah, David Thorpe, Stephen, Una Beeson, Catherine, Kate Binchy, Miss Liddell, Philip Anthony, Dr. Epps, Jill Graham, Martha, Melanie Hudson, Sally, and Linda Polan, Mrs. Webster. The director is Matthew Walters. <laughs>